say good afternoon on this beautiful Wednesday to you, you, yes, and even you. And we want to thank you for joining us on this blessed Wednesday. It is good to be alive and to have a reasonable portion of health and strength. And we love God, we love Jesus, and we thank God for you. Some of you may be asking, what am I doing? Well, I'm doing what I've asked you to do. And that is, I'm trying to give the devil a fit. And one of the ways that I'm doing that, glad to see you, Brother Holland, is I'm actually sharing, that's right, pushing the share button. And so I'm going to ask if you would help me give the devil a fit by pushing the share button right there on your mobile device or your electronic device. That's right. Share, share, share. Just push it and keep on pushing it. And as you push it, I promise you, it's going to be a blessing to somebody. It's going to be a blessing to somebody. I tell people all the time, don't you determine the outcome of someone else's salvation or their experience with Christ, let them decide. That's right, let them decide. Please do that. So once again, share the word of God with those that stand in the need. You know somebody that's standing in the need right now. That's right, to hear a word from the Lord. And as you share, no doubt, you will find that there will be who the, those who will get the notification, and when they receive the notification, they'll probably click you off. But don't worry about that. You just go ahead and share, and the Lord will bless you for your effort. God bless you, Sister Francis. Glad to see you with us on this beautiful Wednesday as well. Once again, share, share, and share. The Lord's going to bless you for being so kind. Let us pray. Dear God, we love you. Thank you for this time of study. And thank you for your word, for your word is truth. May it have free course. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. And they all said, amen and amen. All right, God bless you today. And once again, we are live here at the Antioch Church on this beautiful Wednesday. Can you imagine that August, that's right, is vastly but assuredly approaching the end. That's right, it's getting down to the end of August. I want to also encourage you to be mindful. Glad to see you, Maddie. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to encourage you to get your vaccine. Please, ma'am, please, sir. I want to encourage you to do that. Um, the Delta variant is very aggressive, very aggressive, and in so much that according to the latest stats, 140 plus thousand people per day, 140,000 plus people per day are now becoming infected with the Delta variant and it is aggressive, extremely aggressive. Hospitals are running over. Staff is working double time and triple time. And they are so intent on trying to help suffering people. Some of them can't even go home to rest. Carrying the burden that if I'm not there, people will not receive the adequate medical attention. So I want to encourage you, please hear me, you don't want the Delta variant. You don't want that. You don't want COVID-19. And many who are now testifying on worldwide news, they're testifying and saying that I should have taken the vaccine. Now, I grant it, there are those who have taken the vaccine, and sometimes they are also contracting the virus. But what the stats are teaching us those who have taken the vaccine are at least likely to spread it and, that's right, to contract it. So once again, we want to encourage you, talk to your health provider, 
And please, ma'am, please, sir, do all that you can to take care of yourself. Stay safe, stay prayed up, stay healthy, and if possible, stay home. If possible, stay home. Now, let's go to Genesis real quickly. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I am excited. Let's go to Genesis. And as you turn to Genesis, amen, want to thank God for you. God bless you, Sister Juanita. Glad to see you. Amen. Let's go to Genesis. Amen. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis. Once again, push the share button. That's right. Share, share. And keep right on sharing. Amen. Keep right on sharing. It's a beautiful Wednesday. It's a beautiful Wednesday. Why is it so beautiful? Well, the Lord allowed us to see it. All glory to his name. It's a beautiful Wednesday. It's a beautiful Wednesday. Now, we're going to finish up chapter 35, and we're going to move somewhat aggressively because we're now going to chapter 36 of Genesis. And in chapter 36 of Genesis, please hear me carefully, we will read about the genealogy or the descendants of Esau. All right? The descendants of Esau. Now, in chapter 35 of Genesis, please hear me clearly. In chapter 35 of Genesis, we're going to be in part two as we conclude with chapter 35 of Genesis. And this study has been titled the whole word for the whole world for the whole man. That's right. God is concerned about all of you, spiritually, intellectually, financially, mentally. Hallelujah, somebody. God is concerned about you holistically, all right? He's concerned about you, all of you. The word of God is going to minister to the whole person. And that's what I love about this type of study. We're traveling through the entire Bible. So we want you to invite someone, give them a free ticket. Say, come on and join us on the Bible bus. That's right. Come and join us on the Bible bus. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Now, in Genesis chapter 35, beginning with verse 16, here's where we shall pick up our reading on today. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Apparath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, you shall have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin, Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way of Aparath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edom. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan, Naphtali, the sons of Zippah, Lee's handmaid, Gad, and Usher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Pada Aram. Verse 27, 28, 29. And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Abba which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac 
were a hundred and fourscore years. That means a hundred and eighty years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, let's take a moment here and let's kind of review the last portion of Genesis chapter 35, verse 16 through, that's right, verse 29. And again, I want to encourage you, push the share button, share, tag somebody, start a watch party. Let them decide if they want to join. Don't you do that, I promise you. Somebody's going to be glad you did. Now we see here in Genesis chapter 35 in the first portion of verse 16 and 17 that the woman that, that's right, Jacob loved Rachel. He had two wives and two, I guess you would say common law wives. Really they were handmaids, servant girls to these wives. So he has... 12 boys and one daughter by four different women. All right, let that scene flash across your mind. How would you like to come home? Well, better yet, what if you had to come home to four women and 12 boys, Lord have mercy, and a daughter, 13 children, or ladies? How would you feel if you had to come home to four men? <laughs> That's right. And 13 children by all four men. Broken up into sections of children or numbers of children. Oh my God. But Rachel is the woman that he really, really loved. Oh yes, he loved. Leah was a trick. That's right. When I say trick, she was used as deception and it was trickery by her daddy to marry Jacob. All right? That was a trickster situation. He didn't love Leah. But Leah had more children by him than any other. But he loved Rachel. Rachel has two kids, Joseph and Benjamin. It will be Joseph that the promised seed, the Messiah, would come through. God is very particular about our relationships. Please hear me. You can't hook up with everybody. No, you can't. You can't just connect with everybody. You cannot have children by everybody. You cannot build a stable family with everybody. Are y'all listening to me? So God is very intent. God is very, very, very meticulous about the genealogies, about relationships. Now, notice here that as they journey, now you got to keep in mind that the Bible says in verse 15 that Jacob called the place that God spoke with him Bethel. All right? Place that God spoke to him Bethel. So as they journey, the Bible is clear, Rachel was pregnant. And it's giving you the geographical locations of their pilgrimage. The Bible says she was in hard labor, verse 16 and 17. And many of you know that when a woman is in labor, the medical profession teaches that this is the closest that a woman comes to life and death. All that is within her, every ligament, every nerve, every, amen, strain, every push is needed in order for the child to be born. She has to give just about everything she has in order to give birth to a child. Rachel is in labor pain, intense labor pain. But she's assured by her midwife in verse 17, you're going to have a son also. So she's letting Rachel know that although you are in this pain, you are 
great travail. You shall give birth to a son. In other words, the delivery is going fine, Rachel. I know the labor is hard, but the delivery is going fine. And notice here that in verse 18, she died giving birth. That's what it says in verse 18. She died in giving birth. And there are many, many mothers that have died giving birth. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And notice she called his name Benjamin. All right. Now, the midwife of Rachel is also connecting with the prophecy that God had spoken in Genesis 30. The Lord shall add to me another son. All right. This prophecy was given to Rachel when Joseph was born. So when she had her first child, God spoke to her and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. All right. Another son. And God is no shorter than his word. If he said it, that sells it. Now watch this. She died, but in the process of that, she named the child Benoah in the Hebrew, but Jacob called him Benjamin. Now, as she sorrowed, I want you to catch this. She calls him child of my sorrow. And oftentimes, that's what Benai means. That's what Ben Onai, I'm sorry, Ben Onai means. Child of my sorrow. Now watch this. Oftentimes, during the pregnancy or the experience of the mother's life, the child will be named accordingly. Accordingly, normally. Or the child will be named accordingly as relates to the characteristics or the features of the father or the father's experience. And I'm not knocking it. I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. But what I am saying, we need to be careful. There you go. What we name our child. Because whatever we name our child, whatever name we put to our child, the child has to live with that. It's a psychological impact. It's kind of like Jabez was named by his mother Jabez, which means pain. So she, she named the child pain based upon her environment, her encounters, her life. Sometimes we have to be careful what we name children. Um, not too long ago, I heard about a young lady that named her child Alizé. Now, who would name a child Alizé? Alizé is indicative of an alcoholic beverage. So now this child has to go through life being called, you got it, an alcoholic beverage. We have to be careful of the names and the stigma, thank you Holy Spirit, that we give to our children when we name them. Now she named him child of my sorrow, um, but faith calls him Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. So, this is a prophetic, watch this, I want you to see what God is doing. A prophetic picture of Jesus Christ, who was to be at first a man of sorrows. Oh, you don't hear me today. Acquainted with grief. Ain't that what Isaiah said? And after he goes through three and a half years, Suffers, goes to an old rugged cross. Notice he's buried in a barred man's tomb. And then early he rises from the grave and the book says he is now sitting at the right hand of God. Oh, you don't hear me today. I see Jesus right here, y'all. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of peace was upon, yeah, his shoulders. And by his stripes, we are healed. Like a, like a lamb going before the slaughter, 
He opened not his mouth. Amen. He acted as if he was dumb and not aware of what was going on. He was a man of sorrows on our behalf. Acquainted with grief. But now he sits at the right hand of the Father. I don't know who I'm talking to out there. You may be going through an hour of sorrows. Oh, but hear me today. Right hand means honor in God's sight. The sheep on the right, goats on the left. Right means honor, favor, bestowment, blessings, assurity, confidence. You may be going through an hour or a season of sorrow, but I tell you what, you keep walking with the Lord. That's right. That's right. The right hand of God is going to rest upon you. That's right. Here we find a man at God's right hand is a point at Christ. And I wanted to highlight that in verses 18 and 16 and 17. Now, 19, she died and was buried. All right, she was died. She died and she was buried. And notice it's Bethlehem, Epareth Bethlehem. Now she's buried. This is this is very interesting. Where 1,700 years later, Jesus would be born. Oh, you don't you don't hear me today, boy. I tell you, I'm feeling pretty good. She's buried where Jesus. Will 1,700 years later be born. The Bible is consistent. And Jacob built a pillar, the Bible says, upon Rachel's grave. He, until this day, he loved this woman. Yes, he did. Hand, teas, and toes, guts, and chitlins. He loved Rachel. And Rachel loved him. Oh, yes. True love right here. Verse 21. He's called Israel which means Jacob, but he's no longer Jacob in the sight of character. God is working out the old Jacob. Israel is now his name, which means that he shall be a prince of God among men. He shall give birth to nations and kings. So he is now looked upon as a man who is changing in character. Changing in mindset, changing from an old trickster, changing from a deceiver, changing. Somebody say change. Change is constant. What is it that God is saying to you? You need to change. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm not talking about your soul salvation. But what is it that God is saying to you right now? You need to work on that and you need to keep changing. And somebody out there right now said, Lord, work on me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need some change in my life. I need some help in my life. Oh, glory to his name. God bless you. God bless you. I thank God. I said, I thank God that God is still working on us. Just because you're saved don't mean that everything has changed. Hello. Are you with me? Now, watch this. God bless you, Sister Harris. Glad to see you. Now, watch this. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben, uh-oh, here we go. You know, the devil's always trying to get in the midst of a family and stir up something. And it's normally by way of sexual encounters. Uh-huh. Yeah, I said it. It's oftentimes the lust that one has within the own family circle for another. Uh-huh. Watch this. Reuben, watch this, who is the son of who? Jacob lays with Bilhah. Now watch this. Gonna bless you. I'm gonna help you to see something. Bilhah, uh huh, was Rachel's handmaid. But Reuben, please hear this, is Leah's son. The first wife. Now, let me go back. I want to help you. In chapter 34, we saw the bloody chapter of Genesis. Did we not? You've heard of the Valentine's Massacre where the boys went in and massacred the entire city, raided the city, killed all the men, slayed the men because the prince of that country raped their sister, Dinah. It was the sons of Leah that led in that march. 
we're going to see over and over again how the, the children of Leah are always into something that brings shame upon the family. Now, I'm not picking on Leah. I want you to get something. See, the Bible records history. And polygamy has never been condoned by God. No, it hasn't. No. All these mixed marriages and mixed seed and all. Never been. Watch this. Condoned by God. It's recorded for our learning. But Leah was not the woman that God designed. There it is. For Jacob. It was Rachel. Uh-huh. But he was tricked into marrying Leah in order to get Rachel by Levin. I'm trying to get you, Uncle Levin and the daddy. Now I'm trying to get you to see something. There dwelleth no good thing in the flesh. These children were born out of the flesh. But God, because he promised Abraham, he said, in your seed, all nations will be blessed. Now, let me come back around the corner. Let me swoop back around. Isn't it unique and mysterious to see how God can take our mess ups and clean them up and make them up? Isn't it, isn't it odd to see how God can take our mishaps and swoop back around and bring good out of it? Oh, yeah, we can't pick on Leah, can we? We can't pick on Reuben, can we? Because we all got some Leahs and Reubens in our lives. And God, in our family, we got some Reubens and some Leahs. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. In our families, we got some, yeah, Bilhas and Zoff and Zilphas in our family. In our family, in our lineages, in our genealogy. We got a whole lot of mixed up seed in our family. But God is awesome. Somebody say God is awesome. He takes our mess ups, our hiccups, our all of our jacked up situations. And God takes that and God says, now you messed up, but I'm going to do because of mercy. I'm going to step in and rearrange the furniture and bring good out of it. Doesn't mean you don't have to suffer. Doesn't mean you won't go through something. Don't mean I'm not going to chastise you. But I'm going to bring good out of it because in the end, I'm going to win. That's God. He promised Abraham and the entire seed of Abraham that all of them would be blessed. And the covenant, Abraham and covenant was upon them. But it doesn't mean that God condoned of everything they did. Here it is. His son, good God Almighty goes into the household. Now he's already got a mess. Four women, 13 children, living under one roof. And this elder son knew better. Lust. Uh-huh. And he goes in, the Bible said, shouldn't have done that, by the way. Yeah, he's going to pay for it. Some people don't believe in reciprocity. They don't believe in it. But when it comes around, uh-huh. It's a whole nother story. Verse 22 says, And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went in and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. This woman has had a relationship with his daddy. This woman has had children with his daddy, by his daddy. So he goes in and commits a sin of this heinous behavior and action in spite of he's disrespected his father, he's disrespected his mother, he's disrespected his half-brothers and sisters. And you know there are some folk in our family line that can be very selfish and disrespectful. Reuben did it. He lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel, Jacob, heard it. Now, with this sin, here's what Reuben did. Let me tell you what Reuben did. You know, sometimes we can cut our own wrists. When he did this, Reuben is the firstborn, right? Well, guess what? He forfeited the birthright. That's what he did. He forfeited the birthright when he did this, which shows that Reuben is of the flesh. You see where I'm going? Now, 
Watch this. I'm going to show you how God is going to work. Notice in verse 26. The 12 sons are listed here. Who head up the 12 tribes of Israel. It's really a total of 13. Because you have Manasseh and Ephraim taking the place of Joseph. So there will actually be 13 tribes counting Levi, which was the priestly tribe. Now, through these sons, Israel, the Jews, the Hebrew nation, will be birthed. I'm trying to teach you something. Now, it's important because as we go through the Bible, there are building blocks. And these building blocks that we're learning now, some would consider my type of teaching boring. But I promise you, when we get to certain sections of biblical history, you're going to see why this foundation was very important. All right. Now, verse 27 through 29 says, and Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, and uh, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now, we find here that this man now is 180 years old. That's a long time, ain't it? <laughs> yeah. God is the sustainer of life and death. Now, you have a responsibility to take care of yourself, right? But God is the one who sustains life and death. He says, I have the keys of hell and death in my hands. So he is the sustainer of it. But we are responsible how we live it and how we take care of the body. Oh, glory to his name. Don't make everything spiritual. Somebody say, don't make everything spiritual. There's a lot, Sister Kelly, that we have to do for ourselves. There's a lot, yeah. Sister Brenda, we have to do for ourselves. We make things too spiritual. Y'all don't hear me today. I said we make things too spiritual. Everything's not spiritual. Now watch this. As he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. All right. Being old in the full days. Notice who buried him. See that? Esau and Jacob. Remember I told you these two boys would come together again? And remember in the preceding chapters we discussed how the person that you got over on, the person you deceived, the person that manipulated, you manipulated, or the person that manipulated you one way, some way, someday, somehow, you're going to have to cross paths with that person. You're going to have to face what you did, they're going to have to face what they did. There's reciprocity that's going to kick in. One day you will cross paths with them somewhere. I promise you will. And God is going to give you that one minute, that one moment, that one nino second to make things right. These boys have connected, reunited, and now they're at the funeral of their daddy. Esau and Jacob. What a beautiful scene. Esau and Jacob. But then on another note, it's almost like the day we live in now, right? Some of us don't get together unless there's a funeral. Hello, somebody. And it's really sad that it takes death to bring us together. And sometimes death, that's right, tears us apart. But here we find these two boys have set aside their differences and they're there in honor of their father. That's right, Esau and Jacob. They've been through a lot together, but when it came to the time to lay daddy down in the ground, they set everything aside. That's right. And you know what? There's somebody out there that I'm talking to right now. I don't know who you are, but before that loved one, that sibling dies, you don't know when they're going to die. You better hear me today. Before that person closes their eyes, do whatever you can to try to reconcile it because if you don't, you're going to regret it. But if you give your best effort, God will bless it. It may not fix everything. And you're going to be looked upon as weak. And you're going to be looked upon as the one that's always have to make the initiation. I get all of that. But at least you'll sleep better. Your conscience will be clearer. That you did it before they closed out. Now what they do with it, that's on them. But it takes the bigger person to step up. Oh, glory to his name. You pray and ask the Lord to give you direction. I don't know who that's for, but it's for somebody out there. Yeah, it's for somebody out there. Now we come to chapter 36. This chapter is really going to seem boring because it has a list of names. But we're going to go through it. Why? Because God, that's right, put it in the book. So if it's important to God, 
It's important to me. No glory to his name. Esau. Who is Esau? You know who Esau is. Yeah. Esau is the elder brother of Jacob. You know who Esau is. Yeah. You know, Isaac was his daddy. Esau was the one that cared nothing about the things of God. All right. Gave away his birthright for a pot of stew. But he was tricked out of his birth blessing by his brother, the trickster. That's right, Jacob. And Esau here is listed in the genealogy of the Bible in chapter 36. Again, it's important to God, so it's important to me. All right, you ready? Now, this is going to be a tongue twister because there's a lot of Hebrew names and pronunciation. Some of them you'll get right, some of them you won't. For an example, I am no Hebrew scholar. And I'm going to do the best I can to pronounce them appropriately. Pray for me. All right, verse one. Here we go. Now, these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. He's called Edom because it was called Red. So when you saw Esau, you say, what's up, Red? What up, Red? You know, he was a reddish guy. All right. So he's called Red. What's up, Red? What you know, Red? Edom. Edom is going to be the descendants and it's going to be the lineage and the genealogy. Even cities were named after Esau, the city of Edom, the nation of Edom. All right. Now, here we go. Esau took wives of the daughters of Canaan. Well, shouldn't have done that. that, that. But Esau don't care, y'all, because taking wives of the daughter of Canaan, this was considered a curse because anybody that was outside of the Hebrew race God said, don't intermarry with them. Don't have these mixed marriages with these people because they got mixed gods. They got mixed habits. They off the chain. And this is going to feed into your genealogy. And you're going to worship idol gods. It's going to separate you from me. And it's going to cause vices in your life. And how many of y'all know that one vice leads to another vice? If you have a vice that's unchecked, that vice is only going to breed and take on its own organic growth. That's right. Kind of like the Delta virus. If it's not dealt with, it's going to keep reproducing itself. Are you with me? Now, he takes wives. It's plural. This wasn't no one. No, this, no, he wasn't no one woman's man, not Esau. No, Esau saw women. He got two or three of them. Wives of the daughters of Canaan. All right? So he got Canaanite women. He's a Hebrew with Canaanite women. That don't, that don't even sound right, does it? He's a worshiper of God with women who worship many gods. I'm trying to help somebody. He was raised in a Christian home, but he goes out and he married unchristian women. He was taught to serve the Lord, but he goes out and marries people who have no interest in the things of God. I'm trying to help somebody. I promise you I am. You can get caught up in the flesh and the attraction and the appearance of someone. And miss the boat. Uh-oh. In other words, Esau is not at the pinnacle of his spiritual reality and his spiritual relationship with God. So in the flesh, he chooses these women. And he's going to have kids. And it ain't going to be nothing but a hot mess. It's going to continue to be repetitive over and over again. You heard the saying... Like daughter, like mama, like father, like son. The apple don't fall too far from the tree. Well, he's going to have a whole lot of rotten apples to come out of this. Because he's out of the will of God. Now. Chapter 36, verse number 3. Verse number 2. And Esau took wives. Verse number 2, chapter 36. Of the daughters of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And Ahola Bahama the daughter of Anna, the daughters of Zibion the Hivite. See all these ites, ites, ites. These are heathenistic folk. These are barbaric folk. These are people that worship polytheism, the religion of polytheism, which means many gods. They sacrifice children to the god of Moloch. They worship animals. Y'all don't hear me. They worship water and trees. They worship. They were off the chain. Do you hear me? This is who he is getting ready 
to give seed to the Messiah, the promised seed of Christ, is not coming through Esau. Ain't gonna happen. Because Esau is now married to a curse. Good God Almighty, I don't know who I'm talking to, but oftentimes our prayers and our blessings are hindered because we have engaged with a curse. And it ain't like we didn't know because God gives us a warning before destruction. And I'm not just talking in marriage. There's a whole lot of engagements outside of marriage that we know are curses. Not of God. But we engage and connect with them anyhow. And these demonic spirits, these environments connect with us. Y'all don't, don't hear me today. And it can ruin, it can damage your career, your health, your strength, your, your mentality, your fellowship with God. And it can affect your seed. Oh, yes, it can. And your finances, by the way. Verse 3. And Basimoth, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabajoth, and Ada bore to Esau Eliphaz, and Razamoth bore Ruel. Verse 5, chapter 36 of Genesis. And Abolahama bore Jerush and Jalam and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which bore unto him in the land of where, y'all? Canaan. You're looking for a name to name your child? Go to Genesis chapter 36. There's a bunch of them there. But be careful because you may be naming your child after a Canaanite. But at least it'll give you some thought. That's my point. Verse 6, chapter 36. And Esau took wives. There it is again. I'm telling you, Esau's serious about it. And his sons and daughters and all the persons of his house and his cow and all his beasts and all his substance, which he got in the land of Canaan and went and journeyed from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than they could might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. So we find that Jacob and Esau has a lot of wealth. Esau says, you know what? I'm packing up. I'm out of here. All right? Now watch this. Verse 8. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Now here we find... Repeatedly, he's called Edom. And he's called that repeatedly, not just because he was red or reddish, but because he did what, y'all? Sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. Red stew. He continued to be profane as it relates to heavenly things. He could care less about spiritual things. You know, there are some people, they say, I do chicken. I do red mound. Uh-huh. I do catfish. I do yoga. I do family feud, but I don't do church. That's Esau. He don't do church. No, he don't do it. Verse 9 through 12. And these are the generations of Esau, father of the Edomites. There it is, father of the Edomites. So now you see the nation. And this is important because later on you're going to hear God said, Esau, I've hated Jacob, I've loved. Yeah. And he wasn't saying he hated the person of Esau. He, hurt, he hated the behavior, the lifestyle, the attitude, the motive of Esau. That's what he's dealing with right here. All right, here we go. Verse 10, 11 and 12, chapter 36. These are the names of Esau's son, Elphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau. Raul, the son of Basemoth, the wife of Esau. Well, that's, there we go. Here we come. All right. Let's, let's see. That's two right there, right? All right. The sons of Elipaz were Teman, Omar, Zappo, Gatam, and Kenaz. And Tema was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. Uh-oh. Remember Amalek, y'all. Please remember Amalek. Because Amalek is going to be, his generation is going to be in constant, that's right, warfare with Israel's descendants. You look over in the Middle East right now, what you are seeing in the Middle East are the two nations, 
Jacob, Israel, if you would, and Esau's nations. That's what you're looking at. Both boys gave birth to princes. These boys that gave birth to all of these sons, Jacob's boys, Esau's boys, gave birth to other genealogies. They're both contending over land and territory and rights as it pertains to being the seed of Abraham. And Esau's descendants are correct. They are the seed of Abraham. So is Israel's descendants. However, there's a difference. Esau's descendants are the promised seed. I mean, Jacob's descendants are the promised seeds. Esau's descendants are not. And what is happening, you have Israel. When I traveled to the Middle East, there were certain parts of the Middle East over in Israel we could not go because the contention was so high and so great. So you have splitter groups and terrorist groups that break off from Israel's descendants and Esau's descendants. Esau's descendants are the nomads, are the nomads, all right? So when you're talking splitter groups and terrorist groups, this stuff is rooted all the way back to when Abraham laid with Hagar and had Ishmael. That's right. So Ishmael and Isaac are brothers. Isaac gives birth, and so does Ishmael. So Isaac gives birth to Jacob and Esau. They have boys, and they have countries. And I'm trying to get y'all to see how sin don't stop. And Satan is constantly trying to distort and ruin and cause a spiritual miscarriage in the genealogy of Abraham. Why? Because he doesn't want Jesus to be born of pure innocence. And that's why Jesus came through Mary. That's right. So he could be born without sin. Satan don't want you. If you are impregnated with the divine, oh glory to his name. Prophecies of God, divine gifts of God, divine visions of God. Amen. God has blessed you. Amen to sow good seed. Do you not know that Satan's going to do everything he can to destroy the dream and the dreamer? Martin Luther King was born with a dream. And America cried peace. And he gave them peace. And they gave him a bullet. In the words of Yvette Cornell of Ados. Huh? Y'all don't hear me today. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. Satan will do whatever he's got to do to try to kill the dream and the dreamer. But he couldn't kill the dream of Dr. King. The dream lives on. And the dream was embedded in birth and planted in millions and millions and millions. And so the drum major for justice, the beat goes on. We're still fighting together. As it relates to injustice, trying to get you to see how Satan will get into the seed, into the bloodline to try to destroy families. Why are we killing one another, gunning each other down, have no value of life? Satan has entered the seed of a genealogy, into the seed of a family and is wrecking havoc. And that family seed now is repeating itself, is crossing over to other family members because he does not want, please hear me when I tell you this, the family structure to be united. He does not want fathers in families to raise children, uh, their children. He does not want stability in the community and stability in the church and stability in houses, instability in families. And so what he does... He puts an attack out on the endangered species called the man. This issue of seed is flowing by choice of men in the Bible. That's right. I'm trying to help you see something. And Satan is all in it. But God is going to rule and super rule. So this is recorded for our learning. Stay with me. We're going to pick it up. Now, I got about five more minutes, maybe seven. Here we go. Look at verse 
Number 9, 10, 11, 12, verse 9, chapter 36 of Genesis. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. All right. Today is called Petra, P-E-T-R-A. The country still exists. Watch this. These are the names of Esau's son, Elphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, Ruel, the son of Bashmoth, the wife of Esau, verse 11. And the sons of Elphaz were Teman, Omar, Zophar, and Gatam, and Kenaz. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. Again, Amalek, Amalek, Amalek were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Amalek are going to be some of the most antagonistic thorns in the flesh of the seed of God, of Israel. It's going to be a constant battle. Back and forth. Amaleks, the Amalekites. Back and forth. Back. You're going to see that. Stick with me. Watch this. Verse 13 through 16. And these are the sons of Ruah, Nahath, and Zerah, and Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Bashmoth, Esau's wife. So it's letting you see the breakdown, right? You know, by the way, let me pause and say it's important that you know your genealogy. You need to know who's in your lineage. <laughs> yes, you do. You need to know who's in your lineage. You need to know who mama's mama was and who daddy's daddy was and what they did and their health and their mentality. And you need to know these things, what they did for a living. You need to know where you come from, your roots. You need to know what makes you who you are. You need to know about your DNA. You need to teach your children. I teach my children and my grandchildren how we all came to be. I want them to know who they are, where they come from, what their families are like, what their seed is like. Hello? If you don't know where you come from, likability, you're not going to know which way to go. All right? Here we go. Verse 14, these were the sons of Aholabama, ah the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau Jerush and Jalam and Korah. Boy, I tell you, you're talking about a family. These were the dukes of the sons of Esau. Notice the word dukes. Remember I told you they're going to give birth to princes, all right? This is royalty in Esau's genealogy. Wealthy nomads of the desert. Stick with me. The, wife, the sons of Ilphaz, the firstborn son of Esau. Verse 15, chapter 36 of Genesis. Duke Taman. Duke Omar. Duke Zepho. Duke Kenaz. Duke Koran. Duke Gatham. Duke Amalek. These are the dukes who came out of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada, and these are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, Duke. There they are again. Royalty, nobility. Duke Nahath, Duke Zerah, Duke Shammah, Duke Mizah. These are the dukes who came out of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Bashmoth, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Athol Abama, Esau's wife. Duke Juash, Duke Jalem, Duke Korah. These were the dukes who came out of Ahol Abama. The daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom. And these are their dukes. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabit the land. Lotham and Shobal and Zibion and Anna and Dishan and Ezer and Dishan. These are the dukes of the Horites, of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotham were Hora and Heman. And Lotham's sister was Timnah. And the children of Shobo were these, Alvan, Manatha, Ebel, Shepo, and Onam. Verse 24, chapter 36. And these are the children of Zibion, both Aja and Anna. This was that Anna who found the mules in the wilderness. Highlight. She found the mules in the wilderness. And he fed the asses, the donkeys of Zibion, his father. Verse 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Here we go. Y'all ready? And the children of Anna were these, Dishon and Aholabama, the daughter of Anna. And these are the children of Dishon, Hetdan and Isban and Lithran and Cheran. The children of Esser are these, Bilhan and Zavan and Achan. Are y'all with me? Verse 28. The children of Dishon are these, Uz and Aaron. These are the dukes. There it is again. 
who came out of the Horites, Duke Lathan, Duke Shobal, Duke Zibion, Duke Anna, Duke Dishon, Duke Ezer, Duke Dishon. These are the dukes who came out of Hara among their dukes in the land of Sir, the kings of Sodom. Look at verse 31. These are the kings. Uh-oh. The Lord said through you will come kings, Abraham. Through you, Isaac, will come kings. Through you, Jacob, will come kings. Nation shall be born. And these are the kings who reign in the land of Edom before there reign any king over the children of Israel. Any king. He's letting you know. See that? Now, we're going to close out. I'm going to read 32 through 43. All right? Now, here we go. And Belhah, the son of Boar, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhaba. And Bela died, and Job, the son of Zerah, and Bozra reigned in his stead, and Job died, and Hus Husham, the land of the land, and Timnai reigned in his stead. See, so look at the kings, look at the kings, look at the kings. All right, here we go. Verse 35, and Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Aveth. Look at all these cities and nations that are coming through Esau. But guess what? They're going to be war. It's going to be a war. Over and over again against who? You got it. The descendants of Jacob. The flesh against the spirit. All right? Watch this. Verse 36. And Hadad died and Samla and Mascara reigned in his stead. And Samah died and Saul of Ruhaboth. By the river reigned in his stead, and Saul died, and Bel Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his stead, and Bel Hanan, the son of Akbor, died. You know what? We all going to die. I don't know why some folk think they're going to live forever. By their actions and behavior, they, they make you think they're going to. No, we're going to die. Yeah, no. No, did they? And verse 39, and Bel Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hagdar reigned in his stead, in the name of his city was Paul, and his wife's name was Mahatabel, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Meshab, and these are the names of the dukes who came of Esau according to their families, and after their places by their names, Duke Timnah, Duke Alva, Duke Jahath, Duke Ab Aholabama, Duke Ella, Duke Pinnon, Duke Kenaz, Duke Tinnan, Duke Mizpah, Duke Magdil, Duke Aram, these be the dukes of Edom, according to their inhabitants. Inhabitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. But guess what? I'm closing. Guess what? God is going to shut off this bloodline. Yeah, he's going to discontinue the lineage of Esau. Why? Because Esau represents the flesh. He's going to shut it down. Cut it off. As a matter of fact, Edom and the Edomites and Esau's descendants will disappear from the pages of Scripture. Israel will continue. I'm trying to help you to see something. There dwelleth no good thing in the flesh. Are y'all with me? I said, there dwelleth no good thing in the flesh. No good thing. No good thing. God bless you. Glad to see all of you. Some of you are called out by name. I can't see all that are viewing with us because of the online venues we have. We have several of them. And some of them I'm not privy to see, but I know you're out there. So if I did give you a shout out, bless you. But we know you're out there and we thank God for you. And I thank God for the genealogy of Edom. Know your seed, your family. It'll help you to understand more about who you are and what makes you who you are. Teach that to your children and to your children's children. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. We need to know about our history. So it's important. If God recorded 
genealogy and names in history. Evidently, it's important to him and it ought to be important to us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the dreamer, Joseph, chapter 37. How many of y'all ever had dreams, visions? All right. Well, if you are a dreamer, chapter 37 is going to bless you. But watch this. Be careful who you tell your dream to. Because there are dream busters out there. There are people who will rain on your parade and try to take the helium out of your balloon. They don't want your dream to come true. One scholar said that he was talking to a young man. The young man said, oh, I had such a horrible dream last night and it was just terrible. It was horrible and the devil was working with me. The devil was putting all kind of thoughts in my mind and and uh, as he was talking, the professor said to him, said, well, let me ask you something. What did you eat before you went to bed? He said, oh, I had a bunch of fried foods and had a bunch of desserts and everything. He said, that wasn't the devil talking to you. That was your ulcer. <laughs> that was the food you ate. What are you saying? Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted when it comes to dreams visions all right don't get it twisted how do we identify when God is speaking to us and how do we identify when we are just dreaming and how do we identify when Satan is casting dreams in our spirit thoughts in our subconsciousness come back let's look at chapter 37 I believe in the book of Genesis is going to help us. If you are without a church family, I want to invite you to be a part of the Antioch Church family. If you don't have a church home, we'd love to see you here. We'd love to hear from you. You can do that several ways by acknowledging, A, acknowledging that you're a sinner, B, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and C, confessing with your mouth. It's like A, B, and C. Read Romans chapter 3. Somebody say Romans chapter 3. Type that in the comment section, Roman chapter 3. Read that. I promise you, it'll bless your socks off. Helps you identify why we must come before the throne of grace and fall before our Lord. Also, I want to say to you that for those of you that have never been to the water, never been baptized, amen. We want to pray for you as well. Just acknowledge the Lord, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess your sins, accept him as your Savior. I'm going to pray with you now because our prayer here at the Antioch Church is intentional. We have what is called intentional prayer, which means that we are praying for the lost. We're praying that the Lord will send forth the lost and that we will reach the lost. Let's pray now. Father, we're praying now for the lost. We're praying for those who are unchurched. We're praying for those that have strayed, for those who are lost and caught up in this mean, crazy world. We're praying because we believe that prayer still works. And we're asking, oh God, that you would help us to minister to the lost, to reach out to the lost in the name of Jesus. And we're praying that the lost would come to know there is a song that is written and it fits so befittingly. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. This is my prayer. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And they all said amen. God bless you. We sign off with our mission statement. Jesus is our sender. The gospel is our message. Our target is the lost, the least, and the left out. Amen. Have a beautiful day is my prayer. See you real soon. Don't forget. Sunday morning worship. 9 a.m. Sunday school. And Sunday worship at 10, 15 a.m. And our Bible study is every Wednesday. Lord's will in the creek don't rise at 1230. Noonday and at 630 in the evening. Same bet channel. Same bet time. Same bad place. Amen. God bless you. Loving the Lord. See you next time. Don't forget to visit AMBC. 
1840.org, AMBC1840.org, our online giving. Just download the app at givelify.com and Antioch Church will pull up there. So you'll see where your spiritual needs are being met and the Lord's going to bless you real good. God bless you.